Morning, everybody. It's great to see you and make sure I'm up here. Yes, no? We're good? Beautiful, we're on the air, okay. Today's scripture reading is taken from Hebrews chapter 10. Beginning in verse 19, going to verse 25. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. And this is God's word. For several weeks, we've been asking the question, how do Christians live and how does the church survive in our changing culture? We've considered several things that the Bible says about this. Last, but not least, we're going to consider fellowship this morning. The New Testament has a concept called fellowship. It comes from the Greek word koinonia. And the Bible's idea of fellowship is something like a partnership. Christians are partners. The church is a community of partners in a distinctly different life and reality. And as biblical Christianity becomes alien to the culture in which we are living, Christians must pursue love-guided fellowship. Last week, Pastor Bill focused on loving our neighbors. He focused outwardly. This morning, we're going to focus inwardly on fellowship. Fellowship is not coffee and donuts, though I love coffee and donuts. Uh, fellowship is, well, if you're a Christian, fellowship is your lifeline. If you're not a Christian, I encourage you to pay attention today. Uh, Christian fellowship, as the Bible describes it, is, is unlike anything that you've experienced up until this point in your life. And you may discover this morning that it's the very thing you lack and the exact thing that you need. Now, you may have noticed that the word fellowship doesn't appear in Hebrews chapter 10 while we were reading today. But Hebrews 10 will help us understand fellowship. We're going to see this morning... We're going, to, we're going to learn about the reality of fellowship. We're going to learn about the need for fellowship. And we're going to see that there is a way to fellowship. Okay. In the Bible, fellowship is reality. We need it. And there's a way to it. Now, the letter of Hebrews, it, it, it was written to Christians in the early church, Christians who... Were, were Jews. They were Jewish. They had come out of a Jewish background, uh, ethnicity, way of life, and religion. And, and if you wanted to boil the entire letter of Hebrews down into a couple of statements, uh, it would go something like this. The letter says, if, if you are a Jew, but you are following Christ, you have a new foundation. You have a new basis for faith. The basis of your faith is no longer the Old Testament law and the temple and the sacrificial system. Your new foundation is Jesus. Jesus is greater than all of that. Jesus fulfilled all of that. And in verses 19 through 21 of our passage this morning, uh, the, the word since is very important in verse 19. Since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, now stop for a minute, what's happening right here is you get a summary of the entire letter of Hebrews. 
This kind of summarizes the entire thing. Jesus has drawn them near to God. So since, and there's all the ceremonial uh, temple sacrificial language from the Old Testament. Since Jesus has brought them near to God, therefore, therefore is an important word too in verse 19. Since all of this is true, therefore, three commands. We read of three commands. And the first is found in verse 22. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. Christian faith trusts that God's no longer your enemy. God's, God's our loving father now. There's a second command in verse 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Um, hold on, I lost the, my place in that verse. Ah, for he who promised is faithful. Okay, so Christian hope believes that God's going to keep his promises. There's a third command in verse 24. I'm sorry, where is it? I'm going in reverse. There we go. In verse 24, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Now, the original Greek is stronger. It's a bit more forceful. Instead of uh, the English Bible says, let us consider how we may do this and that. The Greek reads, let us consider one another. It's a bit more specific. Let us consider one another. So what's happening here? You have three commands. The first two commands are, are vertical, okay? Draw near to God in faith and trust in God's promises. But the third command is horizontal. The third command is pay attention to one another. Draw near to God, trust in God's promises, pay attention to each other. So what do you see here? You see this very simple principle. Christianity thrives as we pursue faith and hope in community with each other. Christians are not meant to pursue faith and hope alone as individuals, but as a community. We pursue faith and hope together. That is, that is fellowship. That's biblical fellowship. And the Bible stresses fellowship because Jesus doesn't simply save individuals. Of course he does, but Jesus saves a people. Jesus saves a new community, a new humanity. So fellowship in the Bible is a reality. You can't miss it. If you're reading the Bible with your eyes open, you're going to see fellowship again and again. But is it necessary? Can you live the Christian life without fellowship? My answer is simple, no. And if we don't like that, you know, take it up with Jesus. Let's just get together, send me an email, we'll talk. We'll, we'll just open the Bible and see what Jesus and his apostles have to say about fellowship. We need fellowship. If you notice verse 25, the Bible goes out of its way to give us a warning. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. What does this mean? Well, we know that the early Christians gathered weekly to worship together. They inherited that from the Jewish synagogue system. We also know that they shared in each other's lives. Read Acts chapter 2, you see the word fellowship and you see fellowship described from there on in the New Testament. And the Greek word for give up, you see he says, let us not give up. Well, the Greek there is, a, is, is one verb that means to forsake, to abandon, to neglect. So what the passage is saying is don't abandon getting together to worship. Don't neglect fellowship. Don't forsake one another. Rather, make it your habit to encourage each other. Becky and I, and, and I, don't, I don't say this as a, as a boast, I just say it as a fact. Becky and I, for the last several years, have just kind of gone from one weird, difficult, challenging trial or tragedy to another. It's just been kind of a progression for us, again and again and again and again. And I'll, any one of those, any one of the events that we've experienced as a family in the last several years, just one of them could have completely dismantled our faith or could have torn our family apart. Just 
one. But time and time again, it was our fellowship with this church that held us firm in our faith and kept us from spiraling out of control and out of love and out of hope as we pursued many of you and as many of you pursued us. Even, even when I didn't want you to pursue me, even when I was depressed, some of you pursued me. You just didn't care. You just kept coming at me. So a friend of mine just after the first service was listening, she said, you know, I, I made soup. I, you know, she's making a lot of soup for us in the last several months as we've been, uh, my wife's been taking care of her mother. And, and she said, you know, I mean, it's, that's not really the same thing, you know. I said, no, soup counts. <laughs> that's biblical fellowship. Soup counts. And all sorts of other things. Now, you might be thinking that you're okay on your own with Jesus. Living in faith by yourself. Or that your family, in an insulated way, is fine by itself. Or that you and maybe one other friend are okay as a little click. Here's the problem. It, it just takes one experience. It just takes one thing. One event, one tragedy, one conflict, one death. You just got to lose your job once. Just one breakup, one affair. Any one of those things can dismantle your faith and tear your life apart if you are habitually neglecting Christian fellowship. The Bible likens Satan, our spiritual enemy, to a lion who devours prey. And what do we know about predators? They thrive on the lonely sheep. We need fellowship. We need to be gathering weekly to worship together as a community. But even then, how does the passage put it? Spurring one another on toward love and good deeds. That requires more than an hour together in this room. Public worship is not designed to do that. And it's not going to happen in 15 minutes having coffee and donuts in the other room. Not that there's anything wrong with that. We... You can't nurture Christian fellowship in an hour in this room and in a three-minute conversation in the hallway. The Apostle Paul said to the Thessalonians, we loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well because you had become so dear to us. What causes people, what causes Christians specifically to abandon fellowship? Why do we neglect it? Well, maybe some of you are realizing now that you fit the description of verse 25, that you, you have been in the habit of neglecting fellowship. Oh, there's, there's a variety of reasons. Some of us are just really busy, right? Life is busy, our culture is fast. We, we're tired, our schedules are full. We're mentally drained, we're physically exhausted, we're emotionally spent. We don't have time for fellowship. Some of you are highly introverted. Right? That's, that's okay, but it, when you're highly introverted, it's hard to reach out to people, isn't it? It's hard to make connections. Some of you are wounded. Some people take a step of faith, reach out, develop relationships in a church, and they get stung. They get wounded. People find out about them, get to know the truth about them, get close to them, and people judge them. People mistreat them. You see the ugly things about life and ministry. And so you're wounded, and you, you don't want to extend yourself anymore. Some people are just depressed. And when you're depressed, depressed, you practically can't reach out and you don't want people reaching in. There are so many reasons. But one way or another, you find a way to follow Jesus without his church. You find a way around the church in order to practice your faith. You, you huddle in as a family and you don't, you don't rely on or trust anybody else but, but 
your spouse or your family or one friend. Or even, think about this, you, you rely solely on your parachurch ministry. You know what a parachurch ministry is? Is that a word you hear often, parachurch? It's very simple. It's any Christian organization or institution that is not the church. Any organization or institution that, is, that exists for God's glory, that is managed and led and run by Christians but is not the church, is a parachurch ministry. And there are, man, there are tons of them. And, and for Young Life is a parachurch ministry. Youth for Christ, Campus Crusade, Bible Study Fellowship. Many of us are involved in all these things. Rock Bridge Academy is a parachurch organization. Annapolis Area Christian School is a parachurch organization. And, and, and they are wonderful, and they are a blessing, and specifically because of this. Many parachurch ministries become highly effective in infiltrating some portion of the culture or society in a way that is extremely difficult for the church to engage in, 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 in its largeness, and it becomes clumsy. Uh, for instance, Young Life and Youth for Christ have become highly effective in infiltrating public high schools in a way that a church as an institution could never do. Why am I mentioning parachurch ministries? What in the world do they have to do with Christian fellowship? Here's why I bring it up. I want some of you to ask yourselves this question. Are you pouring yourself into parachurch ministries to such an extent that you're neglecting fellowship in your own church? Ask yourself. You know, and I know, I said to them earlier, I'm going to get letters and emails from you and phone calls about this. But I got to tell you, the only Christian institution guaranteed to endure until Jesus returns is the church. And there's one simple reason for it. He created it. Jesus built the church. Jesus bled for the church. He calls it his bride. He's married to the church. And he told Peter, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. We create ministries. We create businesses and schools and sports clubs and political parties. Jesus created the church. And it's sometimes a mess. And it's always divided. And it's filled with people who drive you crazy. And sometimes they do worse than that. But Jesus loves it. And Jesus is coming back for the church. He's coming back to get the church. And that's why our passage says in verse 25, encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Now I want to consider again the Apostles' Creed, which we read earlier this morning. This is an ancient document that Christians across denominations have agreed upon as a statement of biblical faith for, for thousands of years, for a very long time. This, this dates back to at least the 8th century. Portions of it go back to the 2nd century. Now, uh, the, the Apostles' Creed, uh, it kind of fits into three sections, three, three subheadings. And what do we say first? We, we, we say, I believe in God the Father. And then we continue with all that entails. And then we say, I believe, oh, I keep going in reverse. Good grief. Technology is really messing us up today, isn't it? Then we say, I believe in Jesus Christ. And we profess all that entails. And then the third thing we do is we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit. And at this point, you go, well, yeah. I mean, this is, this is the biblical God. This is the Christian triune God. Of course, yes, of course we believe it. We believe all of this. This is what we all believe. Now watch this. What's the next thing we say we believe in? I believe in the holy Christian church. The communion of saints. You see what's going on here? Historic biblical Christianity has always taught that it, 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 it's, it takes just as much faith to commit to the church as it does to commit to God. 
Tim Keller once said, he believes it's harder to believe in the church than it is to believe in God. That's why it's so hard to pursue fellowship. We want to give ourselves to God. We get to that point. But, but it's really hard to give ourselves to God's people. Yeah, there's the hymn, give me Jesus. And then there's the part of the hymn you haven't heard. Give me Jesus, but don't give me his people. I don't want them. Just let me have him. Well, you know, when John Calvin wrote about Hebrews chapter 10, he believed the problem was pride. The reason the Christians were neglecting regular worship and fellowship was because of pride. Now, he had no way of proving that in the passage, but I think he was onto something. And an illustration of what he's saying can be found in C.S. Lewis's own life. His, C.S. Lewis's own testimony is a great illustration of this point. Uh, he wrote in a letter once, he was talking about when he became a Christian, and Lewis wrote, when I first became a Christian, I thought that I could do it on my own by retiring to my rooms and reading theology and I wouldn't go to the churches. He went on to write, I disliked very much their hymns, which I consider to be fifth-rate poems set to sixth-rate music. <laughs> I thought that was funny. <laughs> but as I went on, I, I, know, I saw the great merit of it. I came up against different people of quite different outlooks and different education, and then gradually, my conceit just began peeling off. I realized that the hymns, which were just six-rate music, were nevertheless being sung with devotion and benefit by an old saint in elastic side boots in the opposite pew. And then you realize that you aren't fit to clean those boots. It gets you out of your solitary conceit. See, people abandon fellowship because they don't want to commit to the church. And buried beneath that somewhere is some form of pride. It is so easy to be embarrassed by the church. It is so easy to be embarrassed and repulsed by the people in the pews around you. It's very much like living in a family. It's very much like having brothers and sisters you're embarrassed about when you go to the mall. Yeah, 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 those are just, you know, crazy people in my family. Anyway, back to that job interview I was talking about. Yeah, I'm a Christian, but I'm way cooler than these people. I... Jesus said to Peter, do you love me? He asked Peter three times, do you love me? And three times Peter said, yes, I do. Jesus said, you love me? Feed my sheep. And it was Paul the Apostle Paul, who said to the Corinthians, three things remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Do you notice that this famous faith, hope, love formula is also found in Hebrews chapter 10? It's right there in our passage today. Three commands, draw near to God in faith, hold unswervingly to hope, and spur one another on toward love. Faith, hope, love, Hebrews chapter 10. So if you're neglecting the church and its people, you may have the same problem the Corinthians had. You have faith, you have hope, you lack love. And friends, without love, there is no fellowship. It will not exist apart from love. But there is a way. There is a way to fellowship. And I'm gonna to suggest today that it's prayer. I'm gonna suggest that we as a people, we as a community pray that God gives us the kind of love for this church that Jesus has for it. If you're visiting, pray for some other church that where you worship. But if this is your place, if we are your people, then let's pray that God gives us a love for this church that Jesus has for it. You love your family? Good. You love your friends? Good. You love your sports clubs? You love Bible study fellowship? Good. You love your country? 
good. Do you love the church? Do you love your church? That takes faith. And Jesus does. Jesus loves it. And when Jesus hung on the cross and bled for his church, he cried out in Aramaic. He, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But if you look in the Gospels, the Greek translation to that Aramaic phrase that Jesus cried out on the cross, the word forsaken is the same word we find in Hebrews chapter 10 when it says, don't give up on each other. Don't give up. Don't abandon. Don't forsake one another. Jesus said, my God, why are you abandoning me? And you see what's happening there? Jesus was utterly abandoned, forsaken, neglected, so that you and I never have to be. By the cross of Jesus and by the resurrection of Jesus, you can be a new person. You literally become a new person. And Jesus gives you, he empowers you with, with the faith to draw near to God for the first time and forever. And Jesus gives you, empowers you with a love for his people. When I got to know Becky in college, she, she at the time was working for resident life. She was a, she was a paid mentor uh, for a hall of freshman girls. So she lived in a girls' dormitory, and she was a mentor for, she was a student mentor for the entire floor. And as I got to know Becky, I had to, I had to share Becky with a floor of freshmen girls, much to my dismay at first. One of those girls committed suicide that year. Some of those girls became Christians. But I had to share Becky with all of them. And I very quickly discovered if I'm going to love her, I'm going to need to commit to them. I'm not going to marry them. I'm going to marry her. But I need to commit myself to her people because she's committed to them. You understand? Following Jesus is very much like that. Jesus, Jesus draws you in. He captures you with his unconditional love. And he gives himself fully to you. And when you get Jesus, you get me. Sorry. And when I got Jesus, I got you. And John got George. And Bill got Dale. And Chris got Lauren. And Dave got Naomi. You follow Jesus, you learn to love him, and he gives you a love for his people. And they learn how to love you. Anything less, friends, is not Christianity. It was the psalmist who said how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life evermore. As biblical Christianity becomes an alien idea in our culture, as it becomes an alien idea, Worldview and lifestyle and reality and existence. We must pursue love guided fellowship. So let's ask Jesus to give us his love for each other, his love for this church. Jesus created the church, it's, it's going to be here until he comes back. Every single one of us needs the church, and the church needs every single one of us. We are the church. And let's pray. Our God, we confess our pride, our fear, our weariness, and ignorance. 
it is hard to love your people. They embarrass us. They disappoint us. They discourage us. We don't understand some of them. We are afraid of some of them. And we'd rather not be around them. We have refused to call your people our people. Father, we ask in full confidence by the blood of Jesus Christ, having been allowed into your presence, into your loving presence, we ask for your forgiveness. We, we trust in your forgiveness. And we ask that you would fill us with the love of Jesus for each other. In his name, for his honor, we ask this. Amen. So let's stand together and sing one more hymn before we go.